is the love song of J. Alfred Blue Rock, the final poem that we're going to cover in the British Modernism section of your course. We're post research paper. We are coming to the co to the close of the COVID nineteen shelter in place, uh, and this will go along with the three posted essay questions you'll find on the right hand side of the modernism mud cave. So just making sure that you have your notes out and you're ready to go. So. To recap, just to make sure that we have all of this information, is your characteristics of British modernism. So I went through and covered this for you in an earlier lesson, but I wanted to make sure that you had them all again. So here you go. Individualism, experimentation, absurdity, symbolism, and formalism. But I want you to notice that I put parenthetical elements here. Individualism, and it's more the cost of isolation on the individual, especially in the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, than it is just the value of the individual that we talked about in American, sorry, in British Romanticism. Experimentation is very much the stream of consciousness the psychological sort of meditation that Prufrock does as he becomes more and more absorbed in his own insecurity. I know that's a lot. The experimentation is more how Prufrock interacts with his world and how he's really unable to understand the images. For this third characteristic of absurdity, it's the feeling of isolation, like you had in number one, of not knowing where you belong, of being lost. The absurdity of the world and how we perceive it because of our separation. The last two, symbolism, of course we know how that functions and what it is. And formalism is again referring to language. I want that in your characteristics, but I do want to make sure that you understand that I'm not going to be talking about formalism in a high school course. So review those ideas as you move forward. So as we transition to the next piece of this, make sure you have your notes out. This will be addressed directly on the test. So good morning. First is apologies. Actually, it's good afternoon. This is your lesson on the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock. So this is the final piece of your second semester 2020 junior year. So research papers have all been graded. All the pieces are taken care of. So you should know exactly where you are and the importance of this particular question. Now, if I, put, if I direct you over to the budget page, I have posted the questions uh, for the exam. It's your job to go through and make sure you have the material. So looking at the actual content of T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, a lot of different things going on aside from five major uh, elements of British modernism. Uh, one of the, so one of the first true modernist poems, that of the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, uh, is a shifting repetitive monologue. So basically the character is rummaging through the disconnected pieces of his own mind, trying to make significant decisions. Now, it's, he's very much a mature male. He's lost, he's losing his hair, he's gotten older. So he's certainly searching for love and meaning in an uncertain twilight world. So to make that much more specific, it is a monologue 
through Jayakrit's internal thoughts as he is trying to find meaning and find love, emotional impact, in a catastrophic, uncertain world. So Eliot wrote this poem in 1910-1911, uh, but really didn't appear in print until June of 1915. So if you look at the historical uh, events occurring during this time, very much the highlights and, and aftermath of World War One and its impact on the British sort of psyche and imagination. This is what gives us the big shift from British Victorianism over into those characteristics of modernism and how they're redefined. Uh, you saw that again at the beginning of the presentation in the slides. So I think those are certainly uh, ideas that you want to anchor onto. We know that Prufrock caught the changes in the British consciousness exactly. At the time of writing, now I'm just reading this off my notes, at the time of writing, class systems that have been in place for centuries were under pressure like never before. The shift from ultimate what I talked about in Chaucer way back with the land gentry and the people owning the land and those kinds of things, and shifting all the way through Victorianism into a cash economy. So these new pressures changed everything. Society was changing, and a new order was forming and really ruining sort of the, the, the anchor, to use that term again, that people thought that they had in society. World War I hugely contributed as well. So when we look at the poem, J. Alfred Prufrock is a respectable character. He, he's, he's certainly stable uh, financially, these kinds of things. But it's implied in the poem that he's seen the seedier side of life, or the dirtier side, the rougher pieces. He struggled in some regard, whether it's physically, whether it's economically, and he's fragile. He's getting older, and he's very much aware of what he's turned into. So as you move through his internal monologue, you get a real good idea that he's dissatisfied, that he's disconnected. It says in the poem that he measures out his life in coffee spoons. Coffee spoons. Very small, designed simply to stir the cup of coffee. So he has taken all of the insignificant, minute elements, elements of his life, and he's examined them. He's become so self-conscious. I think that's a big term that you want to have in your notes. He's become so self-conscious that he's unable to grow. He's unable to make any kind of decisions. He's due for a refresh, a personal revolution, but he doesn't know where to start. So he looks at an impressionist painting. He, he looks at, at these women and he wants to make some sort of impact, but he's filled with self-doubt. Yet he still wants to make his mark on the world, even disturb the universe. While through the poem, he appears nervous, isolated, and lacking in confidence. He may be intelligent, he may have experiences, but he doesn't have the courage or the trust in anyone to do anything about it. So I think very, very important. This illustrates the fragmentation of the modern world. Now if I go back and I look at these five characteristics, I can certainly weave this idea of distrust into those particulars. If I look more carefully at the poem, Prufrock is in a life or death situation. He has to have the courage to move forward and do something with his life or simply disappear. So he has to choose between life and death, very much heaven and hell, both of his own creation, but he has to make that choice. 
So in the beginning of the poem, when T.S. Eliot uses the city, the city's half deserted. It creates a mood that reflects what's going on with Prufrock. Something's oppressive. The sulfurous fog that seems to coat everything. This is the disconnected universe in which Prufrock is looking for answers. And if you haven't figured it out by now, it's very difficult to find these particular answers. A quick aside, the poem begins with an epigram in Italian. It's a quotation from Dante's Inferno. You're going to read the Divine Comedy uh, in your senior literature course. So this will certainly make sense. I can be specific and say it comes from Canto 27. Dante faces the spirit of one hellbound Guido de Montefeltro. Guido, what a great name. So he's gonna go, so this guy's gonna go to hell because he lies and he deceives people on their journey through life. Almost like Prufrock has been deceived in his perception of what he sees. And the two trade questions and answers in the poem. I am reading this because I'm a little sketchy on Dante. It's, import, it's an important setup for the poem as the quote conveys the idea that the answer to all the questions about life will be given by the guy that returns from hell because no one has ever done it before. What an interesting idea. Until you see what's on the other side and you suffer, you don't have the opportunity to give any kind of appropriate or important feedback on the ideas. So with that context, Proof Rock is a story of this modern day hellbound character living in a smoky industrial city, a smoky industrial hell. He is insecure, lonely, and loveless. So this is a little bit more about the analysis of the poem and how we can connect it into the struggles of the Rocking Horse winner, the struggles of uh, Rosemary Fell in a cup of tea, or Jerome in a shocking accident. So Proofrock lacks self-esteem. His life experiences have so broken and destroyed him that he loathes himself, that he is unable to have any sort of positivity moving forward. So I think specifically to prove this point, I look at lines 57 through 61 in the poem. This is where you turn to it, you find it, where he compares himself to an insect pinned and wriggling on the wall. Take that pin and I nail you down. I define you and your existence in that one moment, even though it's a terrible snapshot, it's how I define what you are. Then I look again at lines 73 and 74, where Proofrock sees himself as a lowly crustacean on the sea floor, crawling, sprawling, insignificant. So those two examples, 57 through 61, and then 73 and 74, is evidence for how Prufrock sees himself and his lack of, lack of self-esteem. Very significant, I think. As you move, move further into the narrative, these types of questions about identity and where we belong and those kinds of things continue. So as my notes say, there's an echo of the scene from Dante. And that's why the inscription begins with the Italian. 
And here's the crux or the main idea here. Will Prufrock have the courage to act? Will he have the strength to face his moment of crisis? A lot of the time I've asserted that this moment of crisis is him expressing his feelings to someone else. Do I dare, do I dare make a choice? Do I dare commit to human feeling? Do I dare give in to the fact that I'm overwhelmed and driven by emotion? Do I dare face rejection and be crushing of my entire identity? So I think that's a lot of really important kinds of ideas to think about. He makes us think that he has sacrificed a ton to get to this crisis moment, almost so much that he's unable to make any further choices. So I think there's a lot of interesting things there that we want to be able to examine uh, as we move further into the poem. One last comment before I end this segment. The Love Song of J.L. from Prufrock by T.S. Eliot is filled with metaphor and simile. It's filled with rhyme, it's filled with complex images, lots of things that are going on. By portraying Prufrock as an anxious, neurotic, self-absorbed individual, Eliot invites us to use his work as a way to sort of put ourselves out there into the world. My notes say it's very much a shield between the world and proof rock. Or it's what we put out there to the world so that we don't have to deal with the consequences of our own behavior that we don't have to have any kind of experiences that might hurt our feelings or might cause us to struggle or anything like that. As I'm sitting here today, I'm always fascinated by my hand up and getting this perspective thing. But anyway, that's just a little side moment I'm having as I'm, I'm, I'm proof rocking here. So very much filled with metaphor and simile, proof rock is anxious, uh, I like that term, neurotic. Uh, he's so self-absorbed and anxious and so driven by all that stuff that's happening up here that he can't make any decisions. He cripples himself. When I was younger, I was very much like this. I overthink everything. It was always crazy. So I think very significant. So kind of an interesting idea. Before I... Well, I would say before I get to going through passage, passages of the poem, probably not going to post that for you now, but I'll have that certainly as a tool out there if you want to watch, if you want to absorb it before you take the test on Friday. Now, of course, this is for the COVID-19 quarantine 2020 spring semester. If I do use this in the future, it may reference different days, but we'll catch that up in class. So certainly I think this is going to be a significant idea. Do you reach out and grab the peach? Do you take the opportunity to do something significant, even though you know the risks? You never know what type of music you're going to hear. You never know what the impact of that painting, whatever that painting may be for you that impressionist idea that absorbs everybody's attention. In Proof Rock, it's the women who come and go talking of Michelangelo. Again, these are things that I would think about. Anytime I think about Michelangelo, I think Sistine Chapel. I think the creation of man. I think about these ideas. It's almost like Proof Rock is trying to find that spark of inspiration from God but he denies himself that opportunity. So this gives you something to think about in roughly 14 minutes. So use this as a stepping stone to your reading of Proof Rock. I'll do more later, 
But for now, this is your first proof, proof Rockian video. That's not a word, but I made it up anyway. Talk to you later.